Hello everyone, this is a guided reading of In the Sea There Are Crocodiles, uh, which is the story of Eni Atala Akbari, written by Fabio Gida. So this is one of our year eight texts. So in your um, first part of the remote lesson, you were probably talking a little bit about this front cover. And this is the copy of the book you will be reading when we return to school. And at the moment, we're going to be reading online. So if we open it, you can see um, the map that you would have looked at in the first half of the lesson. So it's going from Afghanistan in the east here, as far as um, Italy here. And you can see a bit of France there. And um, over here is where the United Kingdom would be. Uh, and you can see there's this line going from a place called Nava to Quetta and all the way sort of this way and ending in Italy. So you might have some ideas on what you think that line's all about, but uh, we will find out more when we read the uh, book. So um, the first chapter is called Afghanistan. Um, I am going to read through it. I'm going to use a ruler to help you see what line we are up to. And every now and then I am going to uh, ask some questions for you to think about. And I would take a, a short note if I were you, um, just so you uh, can remember your thinking about the chapter as we go through it. Okay? All right. Chapter one. The thing is, I really wasn't expecting her to go. Because when you're 10 years old, and getting ready for bed on a night that's just like any other night, no darker or starrier or more silent or more full of smells than usual, with the familiar sound of the Moezans calling the faithful to prayer from the tops of the minarets, just like anywhere else. No, when you're ten years old, I say ten, although I'm not entirely sure when I was born, because there's no registry office or anything like that in Ghazni province. Like I said, when you're 10 years old and your mother, before putting you to bed, takes your head and holds it against her breast for a long time, longer than usual, and says, there are three things you must never do in life in Ayat Jan. For any reason, the first is use drugs. Some of them taste good and smell good and they whisper in your ear that they'll make you feel better than you could ever feel without them. Don't believe them. Promise me you won't do it. I promise. Okay, so first page, you might be thinking a little bit, you know, who, what type of story do you um, think this is? Who is Inayat? Who is the mother? They're 10 years old. Where do they live? What's the setting? They're the types of questions I would be asking um, if I was reading this for the first time. We've got a place called Ghazni Province. Now, I'm presuming that is in Afghanistan. Um... And it sounds like this is the place where Inayat was born. So we've got um, that information for us to take on board there. The second is use weapons. Even if someone hurts your feelings or damages your memories or insults God, the air for men, promise me you'll never pick up a gun or a knife or a stone or even a wooden ladle we use for making Gorma Palau. If that ladle can be used to hurt someone, promise. I promise. The third is cheat or steal. What's yours belongs to you. What isn't, doesn't. You can earn the money you need by working, even if the work is hard. You must never cheat anyone, Inayat Jan. All right? You must be hospitable and tolerant to everyone. Promise me you'll do that. I promise. Anyway, even when your mother says things like that and then still stroking your neck, looks up at the window and starts talking about dreams, dreams like the moon, which at night is so bright you can see to eat by it, and about wishes, how you must always have a wish in front of your eyes, like a donkey with a carrot, and how it's in trying to satisfy our wishes that we find the strength to pick ourselves up, and if you hold a wish up high, any wish just in front of your forehead, then life will always be worth living. Well, even when your mother, as she helps you get to sleep, says all these things in a strange low voice, as, warning, as, as warming as embers, and fills the silence with words, this woman, who's always been so sharp, 
so quick-witted in dealing with life, even at a time like that, it doesn't occur to you that what she's really saying is Koda Nagdaha. Goodbye. Just like that. Okay, so we've read the first section, and you might just want to have a think, why is the mother giving the son, Inayat, this advice? Um, she gives him three bits of advice. Um, so why might this be being given? So that might be something for you to think, because then here, Inayat says, or the narrator says, what she is really seeing, saying is Koda Nagadar which means goodbye. And you'll notice in this text, there's a few examples of um, another language. So it's mostly written in English, but we've got here, Koda Nagadaha, and we've got uh, Jan here. So because this um, text is set in Afghanistan, I think those words are probably uh, from an Afghani language. So perhaps it might be Persian or Pashto, um, because they're common languages in um, Afghanistan. When I opened my eyes in the morning, I had a good stretch to wake myself up, then reached over to my right, feeling for the comforting presence of my mother's body. The reassuring smell of her skin always said to me, wake up, get out of bed, come on. But my hand felt nothing, only the white cotton cover between my fingers. I pulled it towards me. I turned over with my eyes wide open. I propped myself on my elbows and tried calling out, Mother! But she didn't reply, and no one replied in her place. She wasn't on the mattress, she wasn't in the room where we had slept, which was still warm with bodies, tossing and turning in the half-light. She wasn't in the doorway, she wasn't at the window looking out at the street, filled with cars and carts and bikes. She wasn't next to the water jars, or in the smoker's corner talking to someone, as she had often been during those three days. From outside came the din of Quetta, which is much, much noisier than my little village in Ghazni. That strip of land, houses and streams that I come from, the most beautiful place in the world. And I'm not just boasting, it's true. Okay, so on this page, we've started to see even more place names here. So we've got Quetta and we've got Ghazni. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to the map and have a little look if I can recognise any here. So here's Quetta. So when we hear, see Quetta... We're in Pakistan, and you can see that Pakistan is very close to the border um, with Afghanistan, particularly the city Quetta. And it looks like if this arrow is traveling, that someone's traveled from a place called Nava, which is just in Afghanistan there on the left-hand side of that border. They've traveled to a place called Kandahar, which is Afghanistan, and then they're in Quetta. So this is where we are at the moment in Quetta in Pakistan. Little or big, it didn't occur to me that the reason for all that din might be because we were in a big city. I thought it was just one of the normal differences between countries, like different ways of seasoning meat. I thought the sound of Pakistan was simply different from the sound of Afghanistan, and that every country had its own sound, which depended on a whole lot of things, like what people ate and how they moved around. Mother, I called. No answer. So I got out from under the covers, put my shoes on, rubbed my eyes and went.